Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for a well warm welcome. Uh, my name is Elena. I'm a data scientist at Credit Suisse. Um, I work in a financial crime compliance team, and um, this talk is about using uh, isolation forest for anomaly detection with application to AML. AML stands for anti-money laundering. Uh, can I have a quick show of hands of who in the audience works within financial crime compliance or otherwise in, the, in this area? Not, okay, quite a few then. Okay, that's good. So in this talk, um, I'll briefly introduce what is anomaly detection and what kind of methods are used. Um, we'll look at the application of anomaly detection to banking, so we'll, co we'll cover the three uh, most often used areas. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, specifically for AML if um, supervised versus unsupervised methods are applicable. And then we'll look at the isolation forest. So we'll step away from the uh, topic of AML and look at the actual um, algorithm. Um, I'll describe what is isolation forest. I'll describe uh, how it's implemented the scikit-learn and we'll compare performance on the public data set uh, KDCAP 99, most of you probably have used that before. And we'll compare the performance to a local outlier factor. Uh, then we'll move to um, uh, isolation force performance on a synthetic data set that has been put together specifically with a few um, anti-money uh, ML uh, red flags embedded in it. And then we'll conclude. Here's a quick disclaimer for you to read. I <laughs> Okay, so what is an anomaly? Um, anomaly is a data point of interest in, in this case. It's, it's something that stands out. It's, it's an, unusual, uh, an unusual data point. Uh, when a data generating process behaves unusually, it results in an anomaly. Anomaly, as a, anomaly detection as a topic is a well-researched subject. There is a lot of publications out there in both statistical and data science. The real challenge for us who practice data science is to essentially define, construct the right data model for the subject at hand to separate outliers from noise and from, from the actual normal data. What kind of methods are used? <coughs> well, the methods are broadly speaking fall into three categories, the density-based methods, the distance-based methods, or parametric. You probably used uh, most of these before. The density-based and the distance-based, they fall into the spatial proximity um, type of algorithms. Um, and the examples here are dbscan, local outlier factor, k-nearest neighbor, k-means, or something like a distance to a regression hyperplane if you're using regression. The parametric methods, they would usually assume some sort of form to your data. So you're assuming that what you're working with or what you have observed so far is normal. And models like Gaussian mixture model or single classes VMs are used there. Of course, there are other methods which are not kind of machine learning methods like z-score, which will assume normality, and many more. In terms of application to banking, so m many of you probably have heard of um, anomaly detection is used in credit card fraud detection. That's a very, um, very well known area where it's used. Um, other, uh, other areas such as market abuse in private banking, so market abuse by clients, or market abuse by both clients and traders in investment banking. I'm highlighting the ML as a money laundering as a subject of detection for all three, retail, private, and investment bank. And what is important to understand <coughs> is that the, the way money laundering is done using these three types of banks is actually different. And therefore, different methods of detections and different types of red flags um, exist in, in, in these uh, banking types. So if you, if you learn one thing from this talk, this should be the one. So another point to be aware of is that um, Automated money laundering detection is very, it's actually an inherently different problem from automatic detection credit card, credit card fraud or automatic detection of market abuse. And why is that so? Well, in credit card fraud, we often, well, we have a luxury of actually having data where we have true positive cases or labels. And why? Because often customers will actually tell us if certain transaction wasn't actually done by them. 
In market abuse, it's slightly harder, but still you have um, you have a signal in the data. So, for example, the PNL, positive PNL, or huge changes in PNL or huge changes in the price move can be used as a self-revealing class. In case of automatic money laundering detection, it's much harder because most of the times, especially from the uh, from the banking perspective, from the banks. Um, we don't really have any data that can be used um, as a true positive uh, set of cases or labels. Um, what banks do, they, if they suspect money laundering, they will file a SAR to the National Crime Agency and often it, they actually never hear back from them or if they do hear it takes years, so it's not really practical. So for detecting money laundering for, uh, for banking, we're pretty much left with just unsupervised methods. So why is it difficult? Well, there are a few papers that actually quite well describe why is it difficult, but of course there is severe class imbalance. This is an outlier detection problem. Uh, what we also deal with is a severe class overlap. What that means is that um, money laundering is, uh, is, when it comes from a single stream of financial transactions, it will actually be mixed with, uh, with normal, normal activity. So what criminals do, they will use uh, front companies, sometimes banks, and it, it makes it much harder to detect. Another thing that we have to deal with is called concept drift. So how money is laundered, even by the same criminal organization, changes over time. And of course, there is uncertainty around the data model. So if you choose to use your suspicious activity reports as an indication for what, um, what, whether certain uh, transactions or certain transactions were actually money laundering, then you have a lot of uncertainty assigned to this. So you have a picture of a candle in the dark. Most of the time, there is actually no candle either. So let's step aside from the problem of money laundering and let's look at the isolation forest. Isolation forest um, is an ensemble regressor and it is different from other types of distance or density based method is that it doesn't profile normal cases and it doesn't calculate distances, uh, point based distances for, the, um, for data. Instead what it does, it essentially tries to uh, separate away uh, data points or so explain away uh, anomalies from normal uh, normal data points. Um, underneath it is building um, extremely randomized decision tree and it uses that um, as, a, as, a, as a base uh, estimator. Isolation forest, why it's so good for anomaly detection? Well, because it can boast, work both as a supervised or an unsupervised classifier. Um, it calculates an anomaly score, which is due to the power of minus a ratio of expected number of edges in the trees for um, in, in the trees in the forest for a particular data point, normalized by a constant. In a supervised setting, you are going to use a threshold, which is a contamination ratio, to uh, to create a binary classification problem. In the, uh, if you can actually use, um, use it without the threshold and turn it into a soft classifier. So as the number of edges, the average number of edges in the trees goes to zero, um, the higher is the anomaly score. So the reason is that actually uh, anomalous data points, they are easier to explain away from normal data points. Um, the, uh, the model isolation force was introduced in 2008 and became available in scikit-learn in 2016, so in the previous version to the current one. Um, it extends the bootstrap aggregated regressor and it's possible to use it as both uh, with and without replacement. By default, it's without. And it's, as I said already, its base estimator is the extremely re randomized tree regressor. So both the attribute uh, to split and the, um, the split value will be chosen randomly. This allows it to overcome uh, building very greedy trees. In practice, in the implementation in scikit learn it will return uh, a value of 0.5 minus the anomaly score. So smaller scores or negative scores will be indicative to, uh, to anomalies. So let's take a look at the performance of this, uh, this um, classifier on a public data set, KZ Cup 99. I'm going to quickly switch to okay, 
hopefully you can see. So I'm going to use KDCAP99 and this will be um, downloaded from the uh, scikit-learn datasets module. And there are a few options for downloading this module. Let's, let me just briefly scroll through the uh, helper methods and we'll look at the datasets. So we'll use SA and SF dataset. SA has only four, um, four attributes and SF has 41. Um, the KDCAP um, 99, for those who don't know, contains logs of offline intrusion detection uh, system. It's been around for quite a while. The SF anomaly rate in this case is 0.5%, so i.e. 0.5% of data points will contain actual attempts of uh, hacking attempts. And SA, I'm only loading 10% of the data, and here the anomaly rate is higher, it's 3.4%. So we're going to perform some pre-processing. So what we're going to do is, we're going to take all of these, um, all of the attacks and turn them into one class. And everything which is not an attack will be, will be a, a negative class, or well, in this case a positive class. And for the sake of um, local outlier factor, I've also normalized the data. And um, fields that are not numeric fields have been turned into numeric using the label encoder. In terms of um, training isolation forest and the local outlier factor, we're going to split the test set and the training set at uh, 33%. And if you look at the um, setting, the features, I'm pretty much using the default um, recommended features. Number of estimators, I'll talk about what this parameter does. Number of estimators is 100. Um, we will use in this case, because we have a label in, in, in the data set, we will use contamination rate of 15%, uh, so much higher than the natural uh, rate of anomalies in this case. And max sample is set to 25. Okay, so it takes about 20 seconds to train on the S um, Okay, this is the SA data set. So this is a smaller one. And on the normalized data, local outlier factor training is faster. But let's look, take a look at the results. So I'm going to show you the output of the, um, of the uh, classification report as well as the confusion matrix. In terms of anomaly detection, what we are always interested in is we are really interested in the recall, which is, which is this uh, upper left-hand corner. And you can see that on the training set, Isolation Forest performs actually quite well, and it gets about 12% false positive rate. Um, I also calculate IUCO, so in this case, it may not always be relevant for you, and it's, it achieves a pretty high IUC. Mm -hmm. The local outlier factor on this data set doesn't do very well. Um, it only uh, achieves a, a recall rate of 8.5% and much higher false positive rate. So one of my questions, so why is local fire factor doesn't do very well? Perhaps it's the number of attributes in this data set. It's quite a lot. It's 41. And um, it, maybe it's just getting the dimensionality curves in here. So let's take a look at the SF data set. SF data set has only four attributes, and it's a slightly bigger one. In this case, again, we're going to split uh, test and trace set at 33%, and we're going to test isolation forest with exactly the same parameters. Take slightly longer to train, and the results are very similar to the previous set. So it achieves very high recall, which is exactly what we're interested in, and then not a very high false positive rate. Again, local outlier factor didn't do very well. Perhaps it's the data set itself. Um, I've also tested it on non-normalized non, non data set, the local outlier factor, and I didn't see much difference. So in this case, might, well, I might say that you might play with the um, number K, which is, uh, which is a relevant uh, K-nearest neighbor mm -hmm. setting for local outlier factor in order to try to get it perform better. But this talk is not about LOF, so let's move on. 
In terms of performance on the test set, what is surprising is that isolation force does work pretty well on the test set as well. So we have a 99% recall, very similar to the uh, training set, and 100% for the SF. Okay. So now let's talk about the estimators. Um, what I find is that isolation forest is actually very robust to parameter setting. Um, and estimators will control how many trees get built in the isolation forest. And we're going to see how sensitive it is to this parameter. For the sake of this particular uh, test, I'm turning my, um, my um, scorer into a recall score. And I turn the um, minus one, so the anomaly, into a positive label. So we'll test the performance on anywhere estimated so number of tr trees in the forest between 20 to 230. And what we see is that both recall and IUC are quite insensitive to this. And this actually matches to what the original authors have published in their paper about the algorithm being very robust. After about 20, it achieves a very good recall. Max samples would control how much of the data gets sampled to build the trees in the isolation forest. And the idea here is that it's the subsampling that helps it to explore these hidden uh, layers or subsets of the data. So we'll look at the performance of isolation forest or with max sample between 10% to going up to 100. So what we see is that it does start to suffer if you increase sampling size. Um, and it is actually also something that um, resonates back to the original paper. Now the contamination rate, so if you choose to use isolation forest as a supervised classifier, it was used the contamination rate as a threshold to define on the set of all the anomaly scores for all the data points where to cut off in order to make it anomaly versus not anomaly. So this is the parameter that the algorithm is actually quite sensitive to. And you can see that we are going to test it for anywhere between 1%. So this is still higher than the natural contamination rate, 225. And after about 10% of contamination, it, it achieves uh, a recall of 100. Okay. So we have looked at, in terms of uh, parameterization, so I said it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty robust to parameters. And in complexity, it compares quite well complexity to k-nearest uh, k neighbor and other distance-based or density-based algorithms. So it's pretty, you could say that it's, it's, it's linear in its complexity. So let's go back to the uh, topic of money laundering. Um, I have said, I started this, this talk by saying what is an outlier, what is an anomaly, but the truth is that most of the uh, automated money laundering detection is actually not a simple anomaly detection problem, and it's not really an outlier detection problem. And why is that? Well, it's because many patterns of transactions that are associated with money laundering, they differ very little from normal transactions. So as liars are, they are hidden in the unusual behavior of a low dimensional uh, subspaces. And if you do learn a second thing from this talk, this should be the one. So I have put together um, um, a data set which is um, well, which it's a synthetic data set. It's made up of um, fake transactions, but it has some money laundering red flags embedded into it. The first uh, Jupyter Notebook is available for you from my GitHub page, and I can share with you the second Jupyter Notebook. If you want to, you can contact me uh, through my blog. The link is at the bottom. So the idea here is that we, we have to take our uh, clients' transactions and trades and we have to essentially optimize it for uh, a set of red flags. The red flags, they are, um, uh, they, there are publications about them, uh, your local financial, cr financial crime uh, 
um, subject matter experts will know more about them. But if you if you are interested to read, then uh, consult uh, Financial Action Tax Force website, or DFS, or join Money Learning Group or Wolfsburg Group. So I'm going to switch to my synthetic data set, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. The synthetic data set is very small. In this case, it has only 200 data points. And I have uh, created four strategies in there. And per strategy, the anomaly is uh, essentially at 5% rate. So what does it look like? It looks about like this, what we've put in the data point in the, in the data set, we have a client ID, we have a made up security name, it can be anything, a stock or a bond or anything. Um, each client in this case has 10 transactions, one transaction per day. We have a notional amount which is purely random source from uniform distribution. We have a flag for whether it's a buy or a sell. We have a flag for whether this transaction is followed by um, an asset transfer. So if it's a buy, then it may be followed by an asset transfer out. If it's a sell, it may be followed by an asset transfer in. Uh, sorry, preceded by an asset transfer in. And then there is some sort of uh, uh, currency pay in this case. We're not looking at a currency pair, uh, at a foreign exchange type of strategy, but this is a fake currency pair in most cases. Um, and we also have a flag for settlement to offshore legal entity. So most of you who work with transactional data will already immediately recognize that this is one step or many, a few steps up after the raw data set. So um, in this case, what I'm, what I'm kind of getting to is to uh, the idea of summarizing transactional data for a specific type of, uh, of anomaly, of a, of a red flag. So I, in this case, isolation forest max sample I'm setting to 50% because this is a very small data set. And what we're going to do is we're just going to feed the raw synthetic data into isolation forest in this case. And after doing that, we will compare what is the mean um, anomaly score for those records that were created uh, to mimic a particular uh, money loaning strategy versus those they haven't. And what we see here is that Isolation Forest does manage to assign a more negative score on average to data points that were designed uh, to mimic money laundering. Visually, this will look like this. So these are the points. This is the uh, first uh, set of uh, traits. Uh, sorry, this is the first set of traits. So this is index zero, and mirror out, mirror in, and then offshore. Also, isolation force manages to get quite a few false positives in, in this case. So let's go one step further. We are now going to actually do what we said. We're going to fold our data set into, um, to optimize it for looking for a particular red flag. In this case, wash trading. I'm not gonna talk about what it is. If you want to know more about the strategies, talk to me after this, call, uh, after this um, uh, presentation. So we will summarize activity at a ratio of buys versus sells in the same security. And this is what gets fed into the isolation forest. Again, with very much the same, um, the same parameter settings. In this case, we're not using contamination rate. This is not a, a supervised classification problem. And in my data set, we only had one, one example, which was a true positive washer. And isolation forest does find this data point. Let's look at another strategy, as a transfer strategy. So if you go on the DFS website and search for Mira, you will find documents that are specific to this. Uh, uh, this it's a very well-known case. And what we are looking for, we are looking for activity where, which is preceded or followed by asset transfers. This is what gets summarized. I fold it into the summary and gets fed into the isolation forest. There were two data points 
uh, not two data points, two trading strategies, uh, all 20, uh, 20 records in the uh, data set, and they are index one and index two. So again, isolation forest does manage to find it. So far, I hope you understood that the idea for um, using uh, anomaly detection algorithm is to be able to explore these um, subsamples of a data set. And another uh, extension to application to anomaly detection would be to use what's called a risk-based approach, which is often what the financial crime compliance teams uh, tend to do. Uh, the idea here is that to actually focus on a particular group of high-risk clients, focus on particular client network, for example, all legal entities that share the same beneficial owner, or all legal entities that actually share the same big code, and, and anything else. Um, and for the uh, so, and then the this this extra um, uh, parameter, this extra feature, would be then introduced into the um, isolation forest. So in conclusion, the anomalous activity in AML is bank type specific. Different strategies are used for different types of bank. Um, isolation forest is a promising, robust classifier that can be used for um, in, within the AML space. The successful automatic detection starts with asking the right question and then optimizing the, uh, the data set for the data model that, uh, that you want to construct. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'd be interested, so uh, isolation forest doesn't scale terribly well. Uh, and typically it doesn't do out of core. So I'd be interested if in the applications you're interested in that's a challenge both in terms of memory or in terms of CPU usage. Right. Um, so as I said, the uh, quite often the financial crime compliance team that will focus on a particular um, uh, risk or group of clients in order to do a risk-based approach, that in itself minimizes the type of records you have to look through. Um, and another thing is that um, unlike in credit card for detection, in money laundry detection, we have a luxury of doing it offline. It doesn't have to be immediate or as fast as possible. You can take, you can take a few days or weeks in order to do it offline. So typ typically the problem is the memory usage. So can I ask whether you're using like hardware with large a large amount of memory or not. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm asking is that people often tell us it's too expensive to buy hardware with one terabyte of RAM, and then I get a fight with the, with the person saying it's not that expensive, and I just can't do isolation forest uh, out of uh, core. So do you run specific hardware or just small computers? Yeah, unfortunately I cannot ask, uh, answer the, the specifications of the machine that we use uh, at the bank. I didn't put it together. I know it's a supercomputer. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you, so initially you showed really good recall. It was sort of in the demonstration. Uh, really good recall, but quite poor LOF. I'm not really familiar with LOF. We just had a quick look now. It's like presuming just something for anomaly detection. Can you just give some more intuition why, why you think that is? Because it sort of sounds like you're yeah. spreading quite a wide net, but then yeah. missing possible anomalies. So I don't know. That's what it seemed like, maybe. Yeah. But please. I'm not sure exactly why LOF didn't do very well on this task. Uh, I think it's, it's just this particular data set. It doesn't perform very well. Um, I have seen very similar performance of um, LOF on this data set reported in other papers. So I just gave up on trying to optimize it. I think it's the, it's the uh, for LOF, the K, the number of neighbors, is, is very, it's very sensitive to that parameter. And I think that's probably where, if you wanted to optimize it, you would, you would play with that parameter.
Thanks. Um, would you be able to say anything more about the metric which Isolation Forest is using? You mentioned about the number of edges. Uh, about the metric, sorry. Ab about, the, um, about the expectation number of edges. A number of edges? Yeah. Um, Exactly. Sorry if the question is not very clear. Um, the the, uh, the so, metric which Sure. Be. Okay. So what happens is that um, isolation force has two stages: the training stage and the testing stage. In the training stage, it will build the trees in the in the in the forest, and in the testing stage, it will pass each data point through each tree, and it will record it will record at what stage it hits the external node. And then the number of edges it has to travel through for each tree gets averaged over. And the shorter is that traveling through for a data point, the more likely it is to be the anomaly. I hope that answers the question. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, quick question. So, because the data sets have labels that you that you can use to calculate recall and, and metrics, um, how do you apply that in practice when you don't have the labels? And how do you tune your your model since you can't, you know, calculate recall and metrics? Yeah, you're right. In practice, we don't have labels, and so what we have in the financial crime uh, team, we have analysts uh, who the cases that are seemed of uh, interest, they get followed uh, forward or two, and they essentially have, it's, it's, a, it's a humans looking at, uh, at transactions and trades and trying to understand whether they are of interest or not. That's how it's used in practice. <coughs> mentioned that false positive rate is about 12 percent, is it right? But uh, in practice, what can you do if you have such a high positive, false positive rate? I mean, you probably get referred uh, such a large amount of cases, and what can you do? How can yeah. you look through all of that volume? Yeah, essentially uh, a false positive rate of 12% for AML is actually very low. Most of the time, um, most of the time, the false positive rate is close to 100. So it's very promising. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you for asking.